from Sand Hill Road in the heart of Silicon Valley. It's the Q, presenting the People First Network. Insights from entrepreneurs and tech leaders. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the special Cube conversation. We're here in Sand Hill Road at Mayfield Fund. This is the Cube co-creation of the People First Network content series. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube. Our next guest is Yubi Kuchar, who's the data-centric digital transformation strategist at GameStop. Variety of stints in the industry, going in cutting-edge problems around data. Washington Post, Comscore, among others. Get your own practice from Washington D.C. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, thanks for hosting me. This is an awesome conversation. We just talked before we came on camera about data and the, and the roles you've had over your career have been very interesting. And, and this seems to be the theme for some of the innovators that I've been interviewing and around the people first is they see an advantage with technology and they, they help companies, they grow companies and they assist. You did a lot of different things. Most notably um, that I recognize was the Washington Post, mm -hmm. which is on the mainstream conversations now as a rebooted media company with a storied historic experience from the Graham family. Jeff Bezos purchased them for a song, with my opinion, but, um, <laughs> and now growing still right with the monetization with subscriber base growing. Mm -hmm. I think they're number one in subscribers, I don't believe, I believe so. Interesting time for media and data. You've been there for, what, how many years were you at Washington Post? I, I spent about 13 years in the corporate office. Uh, so the Washington Post company uh, was a conglomerate, it owned a lot of businesses. Uh, not very well known to have owned Kaplan, the education company. Uh, we owned Slate, we owned Newsweek, we owned uh, TV stations, and now they're uh, into buying all kinds of stuff. So I was involved with uh, a lot of varied businesses, but obviously uh, we were in the same building with the Washington Post, and I was, I had front row seat to see the digital transformation of the media industry yeah, and how we responded. Yeah, let's, I want to dig into that because I think that illustrates kind of a lot what's happening now we're seeing with cloud computing. Obviously cloud 1.0, the rise of Amazon public cloud. Clearly check, done that, a lot of companies, startups go there, why would you provision a data center? If you're a startup, you're crazy. But at some point you're going to have a data center, now hybrid cloud's important. DevOps, the application development market, building your own stack is shifting now. It seems like the old days, but upside down. It's flipped around where applications are in charge. Data is critical for the application. Infrastructure is now elastic. Right. Unlike the old days of here's your infrastructure, you're limited to what you could run on it based on the infrastructure. Right. What's your thoughts on that? I, my, my thoughts are that, you know, I'm, I'm a very, as my title suggests, data centric person. So I think about everything uh, data first. You know, we were uh, in, a, in, in a time when cloud first uh, is becoming old. And we are now moving into data first because uh, what's happening in the marketplace is the ability, the capability of uh, data analytics has reached a point where prediction in any aspect of a business has become really inexpensive. So empowering employees with prediction machines, you know, whether you call them bots or you call them analytics or you call them machine learning or AI, has become really inexpensive. And so I'm thinking more of uh, applications uh, which are built data out instead of data in which is, you know, you build process and then you capture data and then you decide, oh, uh, maybe I should build some reporting. That's what we used to do. Now you need to start with what's the data I have got? What do the, what's the data I need? What's the data I can get? You know, we were just talking about, you know, you need, everybody needs a data monetization strategy. People don't realize how much asset is sitting in their data and where to monetize it and how to use it. It's interesting, you know, I mean, I got my computer science degree in the 80s and one of the um, tracks I got a degree in was database. Mm -hmm. And let's just say that my main one was operating system. Database was kind of a throwaway at that time. It wasn't considered a big field. It was only, database wasn't sexy at all. It was like database. Like, now, if you're a database, if you're a data guru, you're a rock star. Right. The world has changed, but also databases are changing. It used to be one centralized database rules the world. Oracle made a lot of money with that, bought all their competitors. Now you have open source came into the realm. 
So the world of data is also limited by where the data is stored, how the data is retrieved, how the data moves around the network. Right. This is a new dynamic. How do you look at that? Because again, lagging in business is a lot to do with the data. Mm -hmm. Whether it's in an application, that's one thing, but also having data available, not necessarily in real time, but if I'm going to work on something, I want the data set handy, right. which means I can download it or mm -hmm. maybe get real time. What's your thoughts on data as, a, as an element in all that moving, moving around? So I think what you're talking about is still data analytics. How do I get insights about my business? How do I make decisions? using data in a better way. Uh, what flexibility do I need? So you talk about open source, you think about MongoDB and those kind of databases. They give you a lot of flexibility. You can, uh, you can develop interesting insights very quickly. Uh, but I think that is still uh, very much thinking about data uh, in an old school kind of way. I think what's happening now is uh, we're teaching algorithms with data. So data is actually the software, right? So you get a, an open source algorithm, yeah. and Google and everybody else is happy to open source their algorithms if they're all available for free. But what the, yeah. the asset is now the data, which means how you train your algorithm with your data, and then now moving towards deploying it on the edge, right? Which is you take an algorithm, you train it, then you deploy it on the edge in an IoT kind of environment. And now you're doing decision making, whether it's self-driving mm -hmm. cars, I mean, those are great examples. But I think it's going down into very interesting spaces in the enterprise, which is, so we have to all think about mm -hmm. software differently because actually data is the software. That's an interesting um, take on it. I love that. I mean, I wrote a blog post in 2007 when we first started playing with the, um, in looking at the network effects on social media and those platforms was, I wrote a post was called Data's the New Development Kit. Development kit was what people did back then. They had a development kit and they would download stuff and they'd code. But th the idea was is that data has to be part of the, the runtime and the compilation of, as software acts, data needs to be you know, resident, not just here's a database, access it, pull it out, use it, present it, where data is much more of a key ingredient into the development. Is that kind of what you're getting at? This yes, notion and, of and I think uh, we're moving from the age of arithmetic-based uh, machines, which is, you know, we, we put arithmetic onto chips, and we, we then made uh, general purpose chips, which were used to solve a huge amount of problems in the world. We're talking about uh, now prediction machines on a chip. So you think about algorithms that are trained using data, which are going to be available on chips. And now you can do very interesting al algorithmic work yeah. uh, right on the, the edge devices. And, and so I think uh, a lot of businesses, and, uh, and I've seen that recently uh, at GameStop, I think business leaders have a hard time understanding the change because we have moved from process-centric, process automation, how can I do it better? How can I be more productive? How can make mm -hmm. better, I make better decisions? We have trained our business partners on that kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. And now we are starting to say, no, 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 we've got something that's going to help you make those decisions. It's interesting, you mentioned GameStop, obviously well known, you know, my sons are all gamers. I used to be a gamer back before I had kids, but um, <laughs> could, can't keep up anymore. <laughs> you had to be on that for so long. But GameStop was a retail um, giant in gaming. Yes. Okay, when they had physical displays, but now with online, uh, they're under pressure. And I had interviewed again at an Amazon event this uh, Best Buy uh, mm -hmm. CIO, and he says, "We don't compete with price anymore. If they want to buy from Amazon, no problem. But our store traffic mm -hmm. is off the charts. We personalize fifty thousand emails a day. Mm -hmm. So personalization became their strategy. It was a data strategy. Right. This is a user experience, not a purchase decision. Right. Is this how you guys are thinking about it, GameStop?" I think retail, uh, if you look at the segment per se, personalization, Amazon obviously led the way, but it's obvious that personalization is key to attract the customer. If I, if I don't know what games you play, or if I don't know what video you watched a little while ago uh, about which game, then I'm not offering you the product that you're most uh, prone or, or uh, looking for or what you want to buy. And, and I think 
that's why personalization is key. I think that's and data drives stakes. that. And data drives data that. Data drives that. And and for personalization, if you look at retail, uh, you know there's there's customer information. You need to know the customer. You need to know understand yeah. the customer preferences. But then there's the product, and you need to marry the two. And that's where personalization comes in. So I'll get way. your thoughts. You have obviously a great perspective on how uh, tech has been built and now working on some real cutting edge, clear view on what the future looks like. Totally agree with you, by the way, on the data. There's kind of an old guard, new guard, kind of two sides of the street, the winners and the losers behind look at, I think, the old guard. If they don't innovate and become fresh and new and adopt the modern uh, things that need to attract the new expectations and new experiences from their customers are going to die. Uh, that being said, what is the success formula? Because you know, uh, some people might say, hey, I'm data driven. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm doing it, look at me, right. I'm data, well not right. really. Yes. Where, how do you tell if someone's really data driven or data centric? What's the difference? Is there a tell sign? I, I think when you say the old guard, right, you're talking about companies that have large assets that have been very successful in a business model that maybe they even innovated. Like GameStop came up with pre-owned games and for the longest of times we made a huge amount of uh, revenue and profit from that segment of our business. So yes, that's, that's becoming old now. And, but I think the most important thing for large enterprises at least uh, to, uh, to battle the incumbent, you know, the, the new upstarts, is to develop strategies which are leveraging the new technologies, but are building on their existing capability. And that's uh, that's what I uh, drive at GameStop. And also the this, this startups too, that we're here at a venture capital firm, we're at Mayfield Fund doing this program. Uh, startups want to come in and take a big market down or come in on a narrow entry and get a position and then eat away at an incumbent. They could do it fast right. if they have it if they're data centric. And, and I think it's speed is what you're talking about. I think the biggest uh, challenge large companies have is an ability to to play the field at the speed of the new upstarts and, and, and the firms that Mayfield and others are investing in. That's, that's a big challenge because you see this, you see an opportunity, but you know, you're, and I saw that at the Washington Post. You know, everybody went to meetings and said, yes, we need to be digital. And, uh, but you know. They were talking. They went, they, they they went were back to their, to their desk and they had to print a paper. Right, yeah. and so yes, so we'll be yeah. digital tomorrow, right? And that's uh, that's very hard because finally the paper had to come out. And they Let's take us through the jobs. journey. You were the CTO, VP of Technology, Graham Holdings, uh, Washington Post. They sold it to Jeff Bezos. Um, right. Well documented, uh, historic moment. But what a storied company, Washington Post, local paper. Was the movie about it? Um, you know all the historic things they've done from a reporting and journalism standpoint. Um, we admire that. Mm -hmm. Then you know they hit the the media business starts changing, mm -hmm. gets bloated, right? Not making any money. Online classifieds are dying. Search engine marketing's growing. Yes, they have to and adjust. And you were there. What what was the big? Uh, uh, take us through that journey. I think I think the the transformation was occurring really fast. Uh, the new opportunities were coming up fast. Uh, we were one of the first companies to set up a website, you know, but. Uh, we were not allowed to use the brand on the website uh, because you know there was a lot of concern in the newsroom that we are going to use or put yeah. the brand on this misunderstood nearly misunderstood opportunity so uh, i think it started there yeah. and then this is it, classic old guard mentality too. yes and and it continued down because uh, you know people had seen downturns it's not like media companies hadn't been through downturns they had because the market uh, crashes and uh, and we have a uh, recession and uh, you know there's a downturn, but it always came back, right? Because but this was a wave. I mean, the thing is, the, the, the thing is, downturns are economic in this business that happens there. Advertisers, sure. consumption changes. This was a shift in in their user base mm -hmm. based upon a technology wave, right? And they didn't see it coming, a and and they hadn't ever experienced it. So they were experiencing experiencing it as it was happening, 
And I think it's very hard to respond to a transformation of that kind in a, in a very old As a leader, how did, you, how did you handle that? Give us an example of uh, what you did, how you, you, you make your mark, how do you get them to move, what were some of the things that, that were not notable moments? Uh, I think the main thing that happened there was that we spun out WashingtonPost.com. So it became an independent business. It was actually running across the river. It moved out of the, the yeah. corporate <laughs> offices. It went the into a separate place. And, and they <laughs> like were Steve given Steve Jobs a, and the Macintosh team, yes, they go in a separate and building. They were, and we were given, you know, I was the CTO of the dot com for some time while we were turn, you know, turning over our CTO there. And we were given a lot of uh, flexibility. We, we were not held accountable. Uh, to the same level, we used the obviously we used You're running the, fast the news, loose. and and we were yes we we had a lot of flexibility and we were doing things differently. We were giving away the content in some way on the online side. There was no paywall. We started with a paywall, but advertising kind of uh, was so much more lucrative I in the beginning that the paywall yeah. was shut down, and so I, I think we experimented a lot and. Uh, I think where we missed, and, and a lot of large companies miss, is that you need to leave your existing business behind and scale your new business. And I think that's very hard to do, which is, yeah. okay, we're going to, it's happening at GameStop. You know, we, we're, we're no longer uh, completely uh, have a control of the market where we are, we are the primary source of where, you know, you talked about your kids where they go to get their games. They can get the games online. And, it's and interesting, I think that's it, people are afraid to let go because they're so used to operating their business, and now it has to pivot to a new operating model and grow. Right. Two different dynamics, growth, operation, operating and growing. Right. Not all managers have that and growth mindset. And, and I think there's also uh, an experience thing, right? Mm -hmm. So most people, who are in these businesses, who've been running these businesses very successfully, have not been watching what's happening in technology, yeah. right? And so the technology team comes out and says, look, let me show you what we can do. I think there has to be this uh, open and very uh, very candid discussion around how we are going to transform How the would you talk about your peers, the other peers out there, your peers and other CIOs, and even CISOs on the security side have been dealing with the same suppliers over and In fact, on the security side, the supplier base is getting larger. There's more tools coming out. Right. I mean, who wants another tool? Yes. Um, so platform, tool, these are big decisions being made around companies that if you want to be data-centric, you want to be a, a, a data-centric model, yes. you've got to understand platforms. Yeah. Not just buying tools. Right. If you buy a hammer, I think it'll look like a nail. And you have so many hammers, you want versions. So platform discussions come in. What's your thoughts on this? Because this is a cutting edge topic that we've been talking about with a lot of senior engineering leaders around platform 2.0 kind of thing, not like a classic platform to. Right. Uh, I think that each organization has to leverage or build uh, their our stack on top of uh, commodity platforms. You talked about AWS or Azure or whatever uh, cloud you use, and you take all their platform capability, uh, the services that they offer. But then on top of that, you, you structure your own platform with your vertical capabilities, which become your differentiators, which is what you take to market. You enable those for all your product lines so that now you are building capability, which is a layer on top of, and, and the commodity platforms will continue to bite into your platform because they will start offering capabilities that earlier, I remember yeah. I started at this company called Brass Ring uh, Recruitment Automation, uh, yeah. one of the first software as a service companies, and I, we, we bought a little company and the CTO there had built a web server. You know, it was called, it was his name. It was called Barrett's Engine, <laughs> right? And so. <laughs> Probably Apache with something right, other oh, code around it. Uh, you so, know. you know, in those days, we yeah. used to build our own web servers. Yeah. But now today, you can't even find an engineer who would I mean, build the lab stack server, and right? these, these notions of, you know, just simple 
Web 1.0, building blocks of change. We've been calling it Cloud 2.0. I want to get your thoughts on this because one of the things I've been riffing on lately is this, um, I remember Mark Andreessen wrote the famous article in the Wall Street Journal, Software's Eating the World, right. which I agree with in general, no, no debate there. But also the 10X engineer. You go into any forum online, talk about 10X engineers, you get five different opinions, meaning, a 10X engineer is an engineer who can do 10 times more work than an old school, old classical engineer. I bring this up because the notion of full stack developer right. used to be a real premium. Mm -hmm. But what you're talking about here with cloud is a horizontally scalable commodity layer with differentiation at the application level. That's not full stack, that's half stack. Right. So you know, the world's kind of changing. If you're going to be data centric, the control plane is data. Right. The software that's domain specific. Yes is on top. Right. That's what you're essentially laying that's, out. That's what I'm talking about, but I think that also what I'm beginning to find, and we've been working on a couple of projects, is you put the data scientists in the same room with engineers who write code, write software, and and it's, it's fascinating to see them communicate and collaborate. They do not talk the same language at all. What's right? it like? Take a, give us a <laughs> mental picture. Right. Paint so a picture. Data what do scientist they do? Are they throwing rocks much, at each other? Yeah, well, <laughs> nearly because the data scientists come from the math side of the house. Yeah. And they're very math oriented. Mm -hmm. They're very algorithm oriented. Uh, mathematical algorithms. Whereas software engineers are much more logic oriented and they're thinking about scalability and a whole lot of other things. And you know, if you think about a data scientist develops an algorithm, it rarely scales, yeah. right? You have to actually then hand it to an engineer to rewrite it yeah. in a scalable form. I want to ask you a question on that. This is why I got your awesome guest. Thanks for your insights here. I'm going well, we to take a detour into machine learning. Machine learning really is what AI is about. AI so is really nothing today, more than just, yes. they love AI, gets people excited about computer science, which is great. I mean, my kids talk about AI, they don't talk about IoT, which is good that sure. AI does that, but sure. it's really machine learning. So there's two schools of thought of machine. I call it the Berkeley School on one end, not Berkeley per se, but Berkeley talks about math. Machine learning, math, math, math. And then you have other schools of thought that are on cognition. Right. That machine learning should be more cognitive, right. less math driven, the spectrum of you know full math, full cognition, and right. everything in between. What's your thoughts on so the relationship between math and cognition? Yes, yeah, so I, you know, it's it's interesting. I, uh, you know, you you, get gray hair and you, <laughs> you kind of move up the, <laughs> up the stack. <laughs> and I, I'm much more business focused, right? These yeah. are tools. You know, you can get, get passionate about either school of thought, but I think that what that does is you lose sight of what the business needs. And I think it's most important to start with, what are we here trying to do? And what is the best tool? What is the approach that we should utilize to meet that need? Like the other day, we were looking at uh, product data from GameStop, and we know that the quality of data should be better. But we found a simple mm, uh, algorithm uh, that we could utilize to create product affinity. Now, whether it's cognition or math, it doesn't the matter. Outcome is the, outcome. the outcome is the outcome. They're not usually and exclusive. So I mean, it's a good conversation to debate, but it really gets to your point of, does it really matter it as does. long as it's accurate and the data drives that. Yes. And this is where I think data is interesting. If you look at um, folks who are thinking about data and back to the kind of the cloud as an example, it's only good as what you can get access to. And right. cybersecurity, the transparency issue around sharing data becomes a big thing. Having access to the data is super important. Right. How do you view that for as, as CIOs and start to think about, you know, they're re-architecting their organizations for these digital transformations? Is there a school of thought there? Yes, so I think data is now getting consolidated, right? For the longest time, uh, we were building data warehouses, departmental data warehouses. You can go do your own analytics and just take your data and add whatever else you want to do. And, and so the part of data that's interesting to you becomes much more clean, much more reliable, but the rest you don't care much about. I think given the new technologies that are available and the opportunity of the data, uh, data is coming back together. And, and it's it's being put into a single place. You, you want to, well, well, that's certainly a honeypot for hackers, but we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> uh, if you and I were doing a startup, 
Right. We say, hey, let's, you know, we got a great idea. We're going to go build something. How would we want to think about the data in terms of having data be a competitive advantage, being native into the architecture of the system? Obviously, we'd use cloud unless we need some scale on premise for privacy reasons or whatever. But we would, you know, how would we, how would we go to market and we have an app, apps defined, great use case, sure. but I want to have extensibility around the data. I want to, don't want to foreclose any future options. Right. How should I think about my, our, our, how should we think about our data strategy? Yes, so I, it, there was a very interesting conversation I had just a month ago with a friend of mine who's working at a startup in New York. And they're going to build a, a solution, take it to market. And he said, I want to try it only in a small market and learn from it, and he's going very old school, focus groups, analytics, yeah. analysis. And I sat down, we sat at Grand Central Station, and, <laughs> and we talked about how today he should be thinking about capturing the data and letting the data tell him what's working and what's not working, instead of trying to find focus groups and find you know very small data points to make big decisions. He should actually utilize the, the, the target, the POC market, to capture data and get ready for scale. Because if you want to go national after having run a test in uh, uh, part Iowa. of New York yeah. or wherever yeah. it is, <laughs> then you need to already have built the data capability to scale that business in today's Is it a terms. SaaS business? It, it's, no, it's a service and uh, and so you can instrument it, just watch the data. And, and yes, and but he's not thinking like that because most business people are still thinking the old way. And you know, if you look at Uber and others, you know, they have gone global at such a rapid pace because they're very data centric, right? And yep. they, they scale with data and they don't scale with just let's go to that market and then let's try yeah, to figure ship it off out. and get the data, then think of it as part of the, the life cycle of development. Yes. Don't think of it as like the old school and, and, and craft, launch it, and then see how it goes and watch it right. fail or succeed and know six months later what happens. And, and if, you, if you go data centric, then you can turn mm -hmm. the R&D crank really fast. Learn, test and learn, test and learn, test and learn at a very rapid pace, right? That changes the game. And I think people are beginning to realize that Data needs to be thought about as the application and the service is being developed because the data will help scale the service really fast. Data comes into applications. I love your line of data is the new software. Right. That's better, better than the new oil, which has been right. said before. Um, but data coming comes into the app. You also mentioned that the app throws off data. Yes. We know that humans have personal uh, data exhaust. We talk all the time. Facebook right. made billions yeah. of dollars on our exhaust right. and our data. The role of data in and out of the application, the I.O. of the application, uh, is a new concept. Mm -hmm. You m brought that up, I like that, and I see that happening. Mm -hmm. How should we capture that data? It's usually log files, now you've got observability. All kinds of new, new words kind of coming into this cloud equation. How I, should people think about I, this? I, I think that has to be part of the design of your applications, right? Because data is the application, and you need to design the application with data in mind, and that needs to be thought of up front and not later. Yuvi, what's next for you? We're here in Sand Hill Road, BC firm. They're doing a lot of investments. You've got a great project with GameStop. You advising startups. What's, what's going on in your world? Yes, so I'm, I'm totally focused, as you probably are beginning to <laughs> sense, on the opportunity that data is enabling, especially in the enterprise. I'm very interested in helping business uh, understand how to leverage data because this is another major shift that's occurring in the marketplace. The opportunities have opened up. Prediction is becoming cheap and at scale. And I think any business runs on their capability to predict what is the shirt I should buy, how many I should buy, how, what color should I buy. I think data is going to drive that prediction uh, at scale uh, this is a legit wave that everyone should pay attention to. Yes. All businesses, not just one category. All businesses, everything, because prediction is becoming cheap and automated and granular. That means you need to be able to uh, not, not just, you need to empower your people with uh, low-level prediction that comes out of the machine. Data is the new software. 
Yuvi, yeah, thanks so much for Thank great you. insight. It's the Cube Conversation. I'm John Furrier here at Sand Hill Road at the Mayfield Fund for the People First Network series. Thanks for watching. Thank you.